Good evening, and thank you for coming, and thank you for staying. This was an exceptional film on an exceptional night. I want to thank Lisa and Dean and Warner for being here. My name is Ken Schulman, and it's my honor to be the president of Boston Jewish Film, and also my honor to make this discussion tonight, which I hope you'll enjoy. Lisa, I'm speechless. This, and Dean, this is just spectacular. Wonderful storytelling, wonderful filmmaking, incredible writing and researching, and well privileged to see it. Lisa, in your opening remarks, you talked about ordinary people who choose action over indifference, but these are not ordinary people. Um, I would agree with that. <laughs> they really felt that way. They, you know, I found that most people who are heroic don't really believe that they are. They did what they did because they were in, you know, I think none of us could actually say if we were in their shoes what we would do, correct? None of us knows what we would do. Um, they did what they felt was necessary. They were there, there were these children in their midst, and it just wasn't a choice. It wasn't a choice for them. And I do agree they're extraordinary. Oh. Lisa, I think it's obvious why you would be interested in this film, but Dean, how did you get roped into this? <laughs> it was Lisa. <laughs> no, um, yes, Lisa and I had been uh, working together, and um, she told me about this unbelievable reunion, and briefly, the story of her father and uncle, and it sounded incredibly compelling, and I had many, many ties to France. Uh, I have a lot of... Uh, I've lived in France for quite a while. I have a lot of French relatives. And there was, um, and it was actually particularly poignant because only a few years before my aunt had been doing genealogical research and she found the death certificate for my uh, mother's uh, grandfather. And next to religion on the death certificate, it said H. So um, as you might imagine, I'm sure you all know what that, do you all know what that is? Okay, Hebrew. 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 Or yeah. Hebraic, whatever you want yeah. to call it. Yeah. So basically, I had no idea that I had any um, Jewish background, Jewish heritage at all, but in, in fact, I do. So it made it kind of, it just seemed like the right thing to do. And, you know, we went down the long road together. Oh, my God. I mean, it, every time I see this film, it feels like a miracle to me. Um, Uncle Warren Armstrong would feel the same way. And... All these, you know, you're hearing about these people. This film was finished over 22 years ago, so fewer people are still alive in this film. But that we were there at that time to tell that story, it helped that we both spoke French. That was not, that was a very big thing, actually, to, to speak French, that when we were in Chabon, you know, you and my father had been through this situation. So, you know, my feeling, when you're making a film, you never want to go into a place with with a camera until you've gotten to know everybody first as human beings, right? So we got their trust. But I will say that in, in our family, um, I don't know how you feel about this, Uncle Warner, so I'm going to ask you next. My dad never considered himself a Holocaust survivor. It's not how he looked at himself because he was never in a concentration camp, and we were not raised with the weight of the Holocaust. I, I'm not a second generation. Somebody was raised with the weight of that in my daily life. The idea of my father's story completely shaped who I was as a person and my identity and how I feel, felt about Judaism. Um, my parents in the 60s went to find the Pisces, those remarkable women, um, and tracked them down. And to this day, till their last day, they were always surrounded with an entourage because they didn't have children of their own, but they adopted children in the orphanage they worked at. Um, and so, yeah. Anyway, Uncle Warner, let me pass that to you, and then I'll end my can. <laughs> well, Anything you want to say? I always thought of myself as a refugee, but not a Holocaust survivor, because we never went through the terrible things you saw in the film, other than the years uh, up until the late part of 41. We were not there in 42 and 43. Uncle Warner, how did you end up in the States? Who assisted you? There's somebody here, uh, uh, Bob Gordon is here, as I believe, Bob's family. Yeah. Uh, Bob Gordon's family took me in. Uh, they had no family connection, none. As far as I know, I have heard that they answered an ad in a newspaper to take in an eight-year-old boy that, you know, complete stranger, didn't speak English, had no connection, 
and raised me and we're still brothers, uh, still family. So I've been very fortunate and Bob has gone on to do wonderful, wonderful things to save people all over the world. So he's, he's the hero in so many ways. I just uh, wanted to say I was uh, two years old when uh, Werner showed up and uh, I was uh, an only child, I'm sure I was spoiled, and this older boy moved into my room and I didn't appreciate it at all. <laughs> Uh, and uh, he spoke German, and he wore knickers, and he was strange to us. But now he's uh, part of the family, and sometimes more devoted to my family than uh, some of us. So it's been a great experience for us. I'm very surprised my parents decided to do what they did. Thank you very much, Bob. Lisa and Dean, um, it said it's often very therapeutic for people to be able to tell their stories. Was it therapeutic for the people in your film to finally be recognized and to tell the stories, or was it difficult for them? Um, is it okay if I yeah, start with this? So, um, so this was around the time that the Shell Foundation started doing that visual history, and people started really realizing, despite the trauma, that they actually owed it to history, to the historic record to start talking, right? And when we first met everybody before we started filming, Dean and I went to a reunion, a mini reunion at Aaron Sprosner's house, um, before the actual reunion in Shaban that sparked this. And there's a whole uh, highest sister story I haven't gotten to tell. But again, because they got to know us and understand my dad and that connection, I think they opened up. I think the person that was the most, um, everybody was the most protective of was Wolfie. Wolfie, yeah, say, do you yeah. want to say? Yeah. yeah, well, Wolfie, as um, as, uh, as Norbert points out in the film, he was, uh, you know, probably broken by, certainly broken or certainly shaped very negatively by his experiences. And, yeah, that, that was a hard interview for him, you could tell. He and his wife is very protective of him. So to answer your question, some people probably thought thought of it as a catharsis or a positive experience, and others maybe didn't. It's hard to say. And he also, where did you get the typewriter? Oh. <laughs> that it was Raoul or Dede. It was André Dede Leland, who's that wonderful oh, guy yeah. with the red jacket and the kind of flushed face who says, uh, no, mais on t'a pas changé, hein, dis donc, uh, you know, the, you at the end changed. of the, end of the movie. Changed. Yeah, yeah he, he found that typewriter for us somewhere. Or like his, his wife. Yeah, his so, when we went into this town, you know, they knew there was going to be film being made, and I think they expected, you know, a Hollywood crew, but they got Dean and me, and uh, we do speak French, really. His accent's better than mine. And, um, and the whole town kind of got in on this gig. Yeah. The mayor, there's a, there's a shot I was telling Ken earlier, um, where there were some vash limousin, the cows in this region are very well known. And they were in the shade and we needed them in the sun for this beautiful shot. And Raoul, who's a mayor in his 30s, probably at the time, he ran into the field at no charge to our production. And he literally ran into the cows and moved them into the sunlight. Um, it goes on and on. Dede and his wife, André, um, they worked in the Paris subway, they probably for 50 years, and they were retired there. And Jeanette was such an amazing chef, and you know, in Europe, we would film during the light, it would be light till 9.30 at night. And the, the hotel we stayed in, which was teeny, they only let us eat between these, like, very, if you know France, like, very direct times. And so we would eat with them, right? Like at 9.30. Many, many times. We ended up paying, but like the wine would come out and the Armagnac and we would just be there for hours. But the whole town really helped out. I still have that typewriter, by the way. Oh, you have that typewriter. Oh, I'm glad. Do you want it? Uh, no. Also, the person who is, um, who plays Chevrolet in the film is, um, was Jeanette's brother. So that was central casting. I'd like to open this up the audience, because I'm sure there are many questions, raise your hand, we'll recognize you, in the back. You know, with the person with the hand up. Hi, um, thank you so much for screening this um, film tonight. Um, I'm, uh, my name is Edie, and uh, I grew up very blessed uh, to have uh, four survivor grandparents uh, until just a couple of months ago when I lost my fourth grandparent, all call a survivor, so my first grandma without um, any grandparents, so I'm very moving for you to be here tonight. And um, my question for you is, you know, of course, this film was made quite a few years ago, and yet, needless to say, the, 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 the 
to reverberate so powerfully, living in a time in which there are more refugee children than there ever have been before. And so I'm curious how the film has been used um, over the years, kind of beyond the Holocaust context, and how it continues to be used today. Just to repeat briefly, how has the film been used in this time where there is an excessive number of refugees? How has it been used in the past to address these problems? Okay. Um, you know, the film, thank you, Adit, and my heart is with you. Um, so, yeah, this film is over 20 years old, and um, it has it's used in a lot of curricula in, in schools, for example, really from grades like seven, through, I guess, the end of high school and in colleges and universities. And, you know, you're right, even though this is a film about the Holocaust, I never, we never would have made the film if it was only about what happened then. It's about all of us now. Um, it is interesting, though. Through my, through my Uncle Warner, we have a screening with the Joint Distribution Committee um, coming up. And do you want to talk about who saved um, you and my dad to answer Ken's question? We'll get back to you, Dee. Thank you. Who saved you, the agencies that saved you? Oh, the, the agencies that we're, we're aware of, the Quakers were able to obtain 200 visas by the good offices of Eleanor Roosevelt at the time. She was friendly with, the, with Pickett, Mr. Pickett, who was the chair of the uh, American Friends, uh, can't think of the exact name, but the American organization. American Friends Service Committee. Yeah, American Friends American Friends Service Committee, and the uh, so two of those visas ended up uh, getting bringing Peter and me here, probably because Peter was such an outstanding student with with uh, uh, probably the recommendation of the two teachers that you saw in the film. And I was the tag along because they chose he Peter. Says that. I think they chose. I think I got to go along too. Uh, the Quakers, the uh, Osei, of course, the um, highest Hebrew Immigration Association was active in Marseille, I believe. We we had to go from Shaban to Marseille, probably where the visas were assigned to us. And then by, by train through uh, Spain to Portugal, and uh, the joint, uh, uh, I think, had an office in Portugal, and were financing, to a large extent, the organizations within France. So it was American money, I think, to a large extent, that helped to finance highs and that helped help to fi finance, I believe, OSE. And uh, the uh, relationship with the Quakers uh, acting in joint, in concert with these other uh, non-governmental agencies, I guess you'd say, helped uh, so much to get children out. Can I just say, I actually have in my bag what would be the exact number, but I think there was a period between the start of the war and 1942 that we only let in. 331 Jewish children from from Europe and my father and uncle by grace of God were two of them this was not easy you know if we think about today and all the issues we have right now around immigration and bringing in refugees I mean it was a miracle that you got in um. yes please Did any of the residents of Shaban take in Jewish children when they had to abandon the chateau? We're conferring here. I, I don't think so. Not that they didn't want to. They did during the war. I mean, they did while they were, they, they took them in when they were being, there was a danger, but they were really let out. They were, yeah. They, they, they was were let a, out. It was, it was too dangerous. dangerous. It was, it was too dangerous, dangerous to stay there. Yeah. Because as, as you heard, like these these kids actually weren't in hiding. There was a census, you know, they would go into hiding when they needed to. It was just too dangerous. They would have. That's what was so moving about this reunion. That, and it's one of my favorite parts of the film, you know, that everybody, 
you know, Ritz, I, I hope we actually influence the people in the village, and the people in the village really realize they, what, how they were enriched by these refugee children from such different backgrounds. Lisa and Dean, I understand that there are people who have seen this film, have recognized the names of their parents in this film, and come to learn the stories of their parents? Well, um, actually, Liza, is Keith here tonight? I don't want to put anybody on the spot, because I didn't get to see. Is, I don't know, are you, how do you feel about sharing that story? And if so, I don't want to put you on the spot. Do you want to come, maybe? Okay, this is Rabbi Liza Stern, who's a dear, dear family friend. My husband Keith, some of you may know Rabbi Keith Stern, is a Temple Beth Avodah Nun. His father, we knew was a Holocaust survivor, but that's all Keith ever had known. His father died of a heart attack when Keith was 14. So we, he knew nothing about his father's childhood. He just knew that he'd originally come from Berlin. And um, when we, I guess it was about right after the film was made. Well, it was when um, his sister was married. Yeah, but it was right the time, the year was that. It was about the year 2000. Um, Keith's Keith sister was, she was at home and she was ironing and she had the TV on. And there was some movie about children and from the war and she wasn't even paying any attention, but she, she's in Texas. And she looks up and she sees the name Hans Stern. You saw it was up there, but you wouldn't have caught it. But she caught it. She happened to look up, saw the name, and saw the date next to it, which was her father's birthday, which she knew. And she said, oh, oh my god, I think that was dad. And she waited till the end of the film, and she copied down the name of the producer of the film, and she it was, you know, computers weren't as sophisticated as they are now, but she somehow found the email and she, um, and she called her brother, my husband Keith, and she said, this crazy thing just happened. I think I just saw dad's name. I and mean, we don't know anything about what happened to him. So Keith, I think, was the one who took the information and wrote to you, right? He didn't know you. What? It was Joy. One of them did. Anyway, yeah, and then I wrote somebody back. wrote yeah. and said, somebody. you know, we're not sure, but it, we think this could maybe have been our father. And then what happened was quite remarkable. Uh, Lisa wrote back and said, well, actually, it was your father. And over the computer started coming photographs of Hans who had renamed himself John when he came to this country. And there were all these extraordinary photographs of a man I had never met, but the minute we, these group shots came, there was, in my experience, a picture of my son, because my son looked just like this grandfather he'd never known. And because of that incredible coincidence, um, we connected and have remain connected with much love uh, to the entire Castle's family and learned, because of that little thread, have learned the entire story of what happened to uh, Keith's father when he was a child. So we're deeply grateful for you, uh, to you, for giving us our history. It's an extraordinary story, thank you. Are there more questions from the audience? Yes, please. Can you explain to what extent Jose was allowed to operate in these years? Do you want to ask? Oh, yes. Um, to what extent was Jose allowed to operate during during these years? I think um, I think they had seen the handwriting on the wall early. I think they secured funding, and I think they they worked hard to set up to set up avenues early on. And they had, and they they set up children's homes all over the place. Yeah, they set up 14 children's 14 homes. 14 in total. And actually, Elie, so the first, um, the OSA has been around since 1912. The first honorary president was um, Albert Einstein, and then Elie Wiesel. Um, and Elie Wiesel, when he was really liberated, uh, I think Dachau, from Dachau, they, the OSA also had children's homes for, for post-liberation. Um, and they still exist today. So
So they were allowed, and they were part of an underground network. They went underground. And they saved, I think, what did we say? It was like 40, I can't remember. I think it was in the film. They saved a lot of children, and they still exist today, helping children in need, you know, and in case this should ever happen again. But it was that long history. They were set up in what, what you're saying, 1912. Yeah. It allowed them to have the relationships in place to keep operating for as long as they did. Yes, please. Gentlemen. Pirates, where they rounded up many Jews and had them uh, forced into a stadium. And there was talk of very uh, harsh anti-Semitism. Is it because Shaban was more isolated and didn't have <coughs> the uh, influence of the anti-Semitic? Yes, um, it was. It was pointed out. That, um, we did point out in the film to a certain extent that they were, um, you know, they were out in the country. They didn't have the uh, the tabloid headlines with the horrible caricatures of of, uh, of of Jews plastered over the on on the front pages. They didn't have this media barrage that warped their brains. Hmm. That makes me think of something else, but uh, I can't imagine what. But um, yeah, that was that was certainly a big part of it, and it was also a de-Christianized, as we as described in the film. That right. it was really uh, um, how do you say that in English? Laical or yeah, laic? Yeah, laical. It was secular. They were they were so proud of not being religious. It was a place of refuge. Yeah. What yeah. would you say, laical? Uh, I don't know. I, I, my English is escaping me. <laughs> laic. Um, yes, uh, yes, laic. Yes, laic. Yes, laic. Yes, laic. Yes, laic. And I will say we shot on 16 millimeter and we shot on beta SP. So all the beauty shots are on 16 wow. with 11 minute reels, right? extraordinarily easily easy to do that in uh, La Creuse because it hasn't changed at all. <laughs> it hasn't changed still, at all. Still like that. <laughs> that was that network of friends that, that Lisa was network. talking about. Yeah. That same network. Oh, we really need an old typewriter. Bing. Oh, we need an old car. Oh, we need someone to walk and in the woods. How long did it take you to shoot? We... There, well, were, there were two major two shoots. Major and a couple of B-roll shoots. Three, three weeks, probably each shoot, and I got to stay three weeks later to be in the archives while you had to go back to your family. I got to hang out for six or seven weeks then. Paris, during the more research, like when we brought the Pisces into that archive, um, those two amazing sisters that, yeah. Oh yeah, this is Annette Miller, everybody. I don't know, she's a very lovely, amazing actor. Just to, if you don't know her. Um, and I just will say that Georges Langer, the phys ed teacher, you know, who is going to be the, he lived till 108. 108. He just died, what, two years he ago? He just died a couple of years ago. Oh, it's just extraordinary. Just he was extraordinary. so extraordinary. And his nephew, he did the funeral of his nephew, Marcel Marceau, who was Marcel Mangel, and who was also part of the resistance and worked with Georges. Like, you have to be strong to save yourselves. That is one of the best, yeah. Like, like to take one more question, please. Can I ask about Peter? Oh, Elizabeth well, Russell. To hear where Peter grew up and Werner, did, did you get to see him a lot in America? Um, and how was his life? Thank you for that question. Uh, Peter was taken taken in by a, a family about a mile away from the Gordons' uh, house. Uh, unfortunately, after about two and a half years, I think, the family needed the space he was taking up because there was a divorce in their family, not 
the immediate family, but a, uh, I believe a niece got divorced and she had a daughter and they needed room in the house for that niece and daughter to move in. And so Peter was moved out uh, by the Jewish Child's Welfare who had responsibility for us. And he moved to Mattapan. And he used to kid about it that he was one of the few Jewish people that moved from Brookline to Mattapan. <laughs> So, so he grew up, but let's say his high school years were in Boston, in Mattapan, living in, in a group home where an elderly couple took in four uh, boys, four boys. And he went to Boston Latin School. Uh, we used to kid him about that too, but the BHS or whatever it was. Uh, anyway, he went from Boston Latin School to Harvard from Harvard to Harvard Law School and lived his life in Boston, or let's say working life as a lawyer in Boston and married Nancy. My mom. Right there. And Nancy. They, they had a wonderful life together That's for nice. 64 years. 64 wonderful years with uh, Lisa as the, the oldest of the children, but the other two were wonderful as well. Is that an answer to your question? Thank you so much for that question. Thank you. Thank you. Also. Thank you. I want to leave one comment. There are so many moments of this film that are just etched in my memory, I think forever. But the one that really sticks is that the children laughed during the day and cried at night. And I think it's a metaphor for how we feel on moments like this. We're joyous and we laugh to be together. We're alive. We have life. But we also cry because this endless night that's described in this film is ongoing. With that, we're Boston Jewish Film. Thank you so much for coming.